Today I am watching Harriet Rosie, which is nice because she shouted out me. She shouted my channel out in this video. What? What am I saying? Hi guys, Dane here and welcome to another episode of Archive 5. So you may have seen this before, this is where I got five unreleased videos, watch them all together, and they're on a general theme. So this is five non-fiction book reviews. I will have timestamps up on the screen here and in the description below if you want to skip to a specific review. And I guess without further ado, I will take you through what books are uh, in this video. So first up we have Stephen Fry, The Ode Less Travelled. Then we have Dave Trot, 1 plus 1 equals 3. Then we have two horrible history books. So we have Frightful First World War by Terry Deary and Woeful Second World War by Terry Deary. And finally we have Yours Etc, Letters to the Press by Graham Greene. So without further ado, I will hand you out to the previous versions of me that have reviewed these books and uh, we'll see what I think of them. I may set one of them on fire a little bit, but only a little bit. I do not condone burning books. Like don't burn the whole thing and don't burn books en masse. But if you bought a book and it was rubbish, and you want to singe it slightly with a cigarette lighter, knock yourself out. Who am I to judge? Anyway. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Ode Less Travelled, Unlocking the Poet Within by Stephen Fry. I hated it. Do. We are done. Let me read you the blurb, and then I will tell you why I hated it. <laughs> Stephen Fry believes that if you can speak and read English, you can write poetry. But it is no fun if you don't know where to start or have been led to believe that anything goes. Stephen, who has long written poems, and indeed has written long poems for his own private pleasure, invites you to discover the incomparable delights of metre, rhyme and verse forms. Whether you want to write a Petrarchan sonnet for your lover's birthday, an epithalmion for your sister's wedding, or a villanelle excoriating the government's housing policy, this book will give you the tools and the confidence to do so. Brimful of enjoyable exercises, witty insights, and simple step-by-step -step advice, The Ode Less Travelled guides the reader towards mastery and confidence in the mother of the arts. So I would argue this is actually brimful of snarky comments and snide commentary from Steve, like, ah, oh. Like, right, so here is my problem, is that I would consider myself to be a Stephen Fry fan. So, for example, I really like uh, Fry and Laurie. I've read maybe half a dozen of his books. Uh, I've read like two autobiographies. I can see down there I've got uh, Making History, Moab is My Washpot, The Fry Chronicles, The Hippopotamus, The Liar, The Stars Tennis Balls. So I've read a bunch of his books. And the issue here is that he's he acts incredibly high and mighty about structured poetry. Now I write poetry. I predominantly write free verse poetry. I actually don't tend to like structured poetry. And like I, I went into this reading it because I kind of want to learn a bit more. I have written things like sonnets and stuff in the past. I've written villanelles in the past, for example. I just find it really dull both to write and to read, you know, that kind of poetry. However, at the same time, I'm not really condescending towards it. I appreciate that it has a time and a place, you know. Whereas what happens in here is that Fry's really, you know, derogatory towards free verse poetry and the people who write and enjoy it. He kind of acts as though it's, you know, not even worth considering. At one point he wrote a free verse poem and he deliberately wrote it really badly and then when you see why free verse poetry sucks and it's like, well yeah, it sucks because you've deliberately wrote a really bad one. You know, and actually all of his own poems in it throughout as well. He writes these poems to give you like examples of the forms. And I hated all of that as well. So for example, he wrote an acrostic, which is a poem where you have the first letter of each of the lines spells a word going down and the word he spelled is arsewipe. And I get it's meant to be his sense of humour or whatever, but it just made him come off as a right dickhead. Like, it is very rare for me to read a book where throughout it, the tone of voice that it's written in makes me dislike the author and I'm annoyed by that because I've always liked Stephen Fry. My mum has always said to me like she, every time she sees me watching QI or something like that where it's got Stephen Fry in it she always goes out of her way to mention that she doesn't like him she thinks he's a bit of an elitist toff basically I mean I'm from a working class background and he's obviously very well educated but as a general rule he doesn't rub that education into your face 
Whereas in this, throughout, he constantly does. Considering this is meant to encourage you to write poetry, I came out of this thinking I have no desire to write structured poetry. I have no desire to write villanelles or Shakespearean sonnets or roundelays or whatever else we've got in here. Like, the ballad, the quatrain, all of this stuff. I don't know. I'm really annoyed because what this presents itself as like as a handbook of how to do it but what it actually is is just a series of snide comments basically and even stuff like right we get to let me give you let me give you some examples here in the fucking ah oh, it's making my blood boil just talking about it the incomplete glossary of poetic terms so let me read you for some of these examples that he puts in here so for example tomato a red savoury fruit sometimes known as a love apple, which has a place in many sauces and salads, but none whatsoever in a glossary of poetical terms, especially when it has not been inserted in the correct alphabetical order. And I'm like, well, why the fuck did you put it in there? It's not big, it's not clever, it's just irritating. Like, I'm reading through this fucking glossary of terms that already is very infuriating because of the way you worded specific things in here. Rondine, the name of Shiraz's sister in Footballer's Wives. No, but shush at once. Roundelay, refrained verse of some bloody kind. Salad, summary vegetable assemblage not to be confused with ballad or ballard. Why did he put that in? Because I'm fucking there as well, and I'm like on page 340, and I'm like, I'm so close to finishing this terrible book. And I have to read all of this bollocks. I don't understand. I don't understand. My problem is as well is that much of the information about the poetic forms and structures or whatever, that's all fine. It's correct. It teaches you something, but it's delivered in the manner of, it reminds me of this old maths teacher that I used to have who uh, I hated because again, he, he, instead of teaching us maths, he thought he was a fucking stand up comedian. And so I used to get in trouble because I wouldn't listen to what he was talking about because it was so full of jokes that I'm like, I'm, like, I'm just going to read. Like, I used to just read the textbook instead because I'd learn from the textbook. Whereas if I was watching him make his fucking bad stand-up routine, I didn't learn anything. The thing is that I think is that things like spoken word, for example, is the future of poetry. Whether people like Stephen Fry like it or not. And honestly, having read this book, it's just made me more convinced that that is the case because people my age and younger, they're not going to want to read books like this by some snarky old geezer who just thinks that he's right and that everybody else is wrong. I personally was willing to think that, you know, structured and, un and free verse poetry could coexist. But after reading this, I'm like, apparently not. <laughs> if you want to get into poetry, don't read this book. So... I was originally going to read this as a buddy read with Claudia from Spinster's Library. Shout out to Claudia if she's watching. I don't know if you've read this and maybe you got something different from it. Personally, I would say if you want to get into poetry, definitely don't read this book. That will ju It'll just kill your love for it before you even get started. Instead, you're better reading one of the, like, the poetry books that I reviewed by Deborah Ulmer, for example, The Emergency Poet or something like that, The Everyday Poet, which are literally just poetry anthologies, but at least... You know, they cover a lot of the types of poetry that are in this book, but they don't suck all of the joy out of it. So at least you could read them and enjoy the poetry. And maybe then that will make you want to learn more about the structure of a sonnet or something like that, or what a dactyl is. Which, again, I did want to learn that stuff, but the way in which the lesson was delivered was so infuriating, I just wanted to fucking do this. So yeah, I'm going to give it a 2 out of 5. And the reason it's not getting a 1 out of 5 is because the information within it itself is correct. It's just presented in such a smarmy way that it's incredibly off-putting. And I've lost a lot of respect for Stephen Fry over this book. Like I say, I've read a half dozen of his books before. And actually, the only reason I finished reading this is because I do kind of want to read all of his books because I made a good dent in them. But now, I mean, I know I think he's done a book on um, mythology as well. And I have no desire to read that because, again, I find myth mythology interesting. And I don't want to lose part of my love for mythology by being fucking lectured to by some sanctimonious old... So, yeah, there you have it. Not very happy with this book. And I, I don't know why Fry wrote it like that. I really don't. I don't know why he... 
had to cover it with such a layer of grease. And but anyway, that's what I thought about the ode less travelled. As always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button. Hit subscribe for more bookish videos. And I will see you soon for another one. Thanks a lot. Bye bye Is that going to get me a dislike? I don't know if that's going to get me a dislike. That's maybe a bit extreme. Don't burn this book. Just don't buy it. Hi guys, Dane here. And today I'm going to be doing a quick review of 1 plus 1 equals 3. A masterclass in creative thinking by Dave Trott. So as usual, I'm going to read you the blurb. How do you make something out of nothing? Up your game with this masterclass in creative thinking. Written in Dave Trott's distinctive, almost zen-like style, 1 plus 1 equals 3 is a collection of provocative anecdotes and thought experiments designed to light a fire under your own creative ambitions. From the First World War sailor who survived being sunk three times in one day, to the one-time merchant of death who made his name a byword for peace, and the gypsy who lost two fingers and then reinvented jazz. From boardroom to battlefield, these stories of unconventional wisdom from one of the world's true advertising greats are a rallying cry for anyone who wants to think differently, stand out and truly innovate. Dave Trott is an ad man, basically he was co-founder of Gold Greenlee's Trot, which has been voted Agency of the Year, and he has this really unique style of writing in which he writes in kind of short, punchy sentences, and he basically tells a story and then uses that story as kind of like almost like a parable, a, a lesson to teach you ways of thinking. As much as I hate the phrase thinking outside the box, that's what this is about. It's about helping you to think outside the box and to look at problems and challenges in a different way, in such a way that they can give you an edge over the competition. So I'm going to actually read some of my favourite examples here because I think they're a great way of showing you really how how Trot's writing style is. You, you'll, I need to really read out a few of these for you to tell whether this book is going to be for you or not. What I will say is that he's an advertising guy, so if you work in marketing or PR or anything like that, I used to work in marketing, so that's how I kind of came across his name. But um, if you work in any of those fields, you're possibly going to get slightly more value out of it. But I mostly was taking things from this that I can apply to my own writing and just my own life, really. So... I don't think it's necessarily a marketing book. It's more, if anything, it's an inspirational book. You can't really read this and take the lessons and apply them directly to something, you know. It, it just teaches you a way of thinking a little bit differently and gives you a few ideas to kind of push your mind in that direction. So with that said, I will read you a few examples. Okay, so this is Choice Architecture. At a school in the USA, the girls in their early teens had just discovered lipstick. They would go into the female toilets to apply it. Then, giggling, they'd leave imprints of their lips on the large mirror. This made a lot of extra work for the cleaning staff. The head teacher asked the girls to stop. Of course, they ignored her. So she took the girls to the toilets for a demonstration. She said, it takes a lot of work to clean the lipstick off the mirror. She said to the janitor, please show the girls how much work it takes. The janitor put the mop in the toilet, squeezed off the excess water and washed the mirror. Then put the mop in the toilet again and repeated the process. From that day on, there was no more lipstick on the mirror. That's choice architecture. Don't try to force or nag people into doing what you want. Accept that they are free to choose. But you help them choose what you want. The girls could still choose to kiss the mirror. But now they know that their lips are touching the water from the toilets that everyone uses. Suddenly, it's not a, such an attractive idea. No one wants to be kissed by lips with water from public toilet on them. The girls are still free to choose but the architecture of the choice encourages them in a certain direction, just as architecture encourages people in, to use buildings in a particular way. You design the building the way you want people to use it. That way you don't have to nag people. The National Portrait Gallery's problem was that very few people visited the upper floors while the ground floor was always packed. People couldn't be bothered to climb flights of stairs, so they borrowed an idea from Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim building in New York. They changed the entrance. They installed a large escalator right by it, taking visitors straight up to the top floor. The exhibition now started at the top floor and worked its way down to the ground floor. The stairs were now for walking down, not up. Quite literally, choice architecture. A writer at our agency, Rob DeKlein, found another great example of choice architecture in his local paper. A village in Kent had a problem with litter. Sweet wrappers, crisp packets, soft drink cans and bottles were strewn all over the streets. But the local shopkeeper didn't complain or nag the children. He just wrote their name on the crisp and sweet packets when they bought them. That's all, just the child's name. And the litter problem cleared up almost immediately. That's choice architecture. 
The children could still choose to throw their wrappers in the street. They didn't have to put them in the litter bin. The only difference was that now everyone would know whose litter it was. See, you don't have to threaten or restrict or dictate anyone's choices. If you're clever, you can just rearrange the architecture. This is a good one. So this is called Reinterpret the Brief. Jerry Weintraub was a young concert promoter. He'd finally managed to get the biggest break of his life. He'd talked Elvis Presley into letting him promote a tour. If the tour was a success, Weintraub was a success. But if the tour was a failure, it was the end of his career. Not only would he be broke, but word would spread. No other act would ever let him promote them. Elvis had only had one stipulation. I don't want to see any empty seats in any of my shows. That sounded fair enough to Weintraub. In fact, even before the tour started, the seats for all the evening shows were sold out. This made Weintraub wonder if he could sell some tickets for matinee concerts. So he briefed the manager of the first venue to advertise a daytime performance. On the morning of the show, Weintraub turned up at the manager's office. He noticed a pile of tickets on the table. The manager said a few hundred seats were unsold because it was a daytime performance. Weintraub's life flashed before his eyes. Elvis Presley was about to go on stage and see the one thing he'd said he didn't want to see, several hundred empty seats. Weintraub thought it was the end of his career. How the hell was he going to fill up the theatre with just hours to go? Then he realised that filling the theatre wasn't the brief. I don't want to see any empty seats was the brief. So Weintraub had workmen take out all the back rows at the theatre. When Elvis came on stage, all he saw was a packed theatre without a single empty seat. The concert and the tour were the turning point in Weintraub's career. He went on to become the biggest concert promoter in the US. Many years later, some environmental activists had a very different sort of problem in the Arctic. Seal hunters were clubbing thousands of seal pups to death. The pelts from the young pups made beautiful soft seal skin coats. The hunters just walked up and crushed their skulls. The question for the activists was how to stop the killing. There were too many hunters for them to stop them individually. And the hunters were tough, violent men. Then the activists realised the brief wasn't to stop the hunters. The brief was to prevent the pups being killed. They could ignore the hunters and remove the reason to kill the pups. The activists went all over the Arctic with spray cans of paint. They simply sprayed a splash of paint on every seal pup. The pups didn't care. Once it dried, they didn't even know it was there. But it ruined their pelts for making coats. Now there was no point in the hunters killing seal pups because they couldn't sell the pelts. Jerry Reintraub and the environmental activists discovered the same thing. Real creativity doesn't come from struggling to answer a difficult brief. Real creativity comes from getting upstream of the brief and finding a different answer. Reinterpreting the brief is often solving the problem. Also, the cat's just decided to show up. Look at him. Hey, Biggie. I guess we'll uh, finish the rest of the review from this angle. Okay, I'm going to read one last reading from this, and that is, Creativity is Messy. And uh, it begins with a name that I can't pronounce. That's a good start. Jao Maguello is a physics professor at Imperial College London. He is Portuguese and has lived in England for 25 years. He's written a book about us. He says the English are one of the most rigid and rotten societies in Europe, possibly the world. He says, I never met such a group of animals. English culture is pathologically violent. He says, oral sex is not considered a sexual act among the English. It is something a woman can perform on a stranger whose name she doesn't even know. No one cares. He says, when you visit English homes, they are all so disgusting that even my grandmother's poultry cage is cleaner. He says, it is not unusual to drink 12 pints or two huge buckets of beer per person. Even a horse would get drunk with this, but in England it is standard practice. In England, real men have to drink like sponges and throw up everything at the end of the evening. He says, they say it's grim up north and now I see why. People in the north are incredibly obese. Men and women with three metre waists made of fat and lard. Blackpool Beach is an ideal place to see these human whales. The book was on the bestseller list in Portugal for six months. So given the professor is so disgusted with us, why did he stay in England for so long? He says, I love the British sense of humour. I love the tolerance, the creativity and the madness of the people. There is an incapacity for institutional repression, which I like. I think that's really interesting. What he calls the incapacity for institutional repression. In other words, rebelliousness, questioning the rules, a refusal to bow to authority. The problem is that you can't have it both ways. You can't have an exciting, dynamic, creative society and one which also follows all the rules of decorum and good taste. You can't follow the rules while you're breaking the rules. That is the dichotomy. It reminds me of a conversation I heard at dinner one evening between Bob Brooks and Oscar Grillo. 
Bob was a brilliant film director from New York. Oscar is a brilliant animator from Buenos Aires. Both loved London, but Bob was grumbling about it. Bob said, the problem is nothing fucking works. The goddamn buses, the goddamn trains, the goddamn roads, nothing fucking works. Oscar said, of course it doesn't work. Why do you think we come here? What do you think we want? Fucking Switzerland? And that summed it up for me. England, especially London, is messy, and that's what makes it interesting. Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square by celebrates one of our greatest naval victories. Look up the crew list on Nelson's flagship, HMS Victory. They were English, Scottish, Welsh and Irish, but they were also Danish, Norwegian, Canadian, German, Dutch, Swedish, Swiss, Maltese, Portuguese, Brazilian, Indian, Jamaican, African, American, even French, and that was just one ship. What I've always loved about London is that, like New York, it attracts creativity and that means rebels from all over the world. The best thrives because it's the best, not because it's the nicest, but of course that can get messy, that's the price you pay. Orson Welles summed it up best in The Third Man. In Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love, 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. I also like what Voltaire said about the English. The English are like their own beer. The dregs are at the bottom. The top is nothing but froth. But the middle is quite excellent. So yeah, that's about all I'm going to say about 1 plus 1 equals 3 by Dave Trott. I think he has this kind of style where you're either going to really like his stuff or you're really going to hate it. I really like his stuff. I thought this was insightful. You also kind of learn stuff about other stuff while you're reading it so you're not just learning about creative thinking you're learning about history or art or whatever he's using to you know draw from for his his examples and i think that's pretty cool so i'm going to give this a four out of five i think it's pretty good and i'm going to be reading the rest of dave trot's stuff i mean it probably only took a couple hours two three hours to read this as well so there's that and yeah i'd recommend it if it sounds like your kind of thing so as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Today, I am watching Jean Bookish Thoughts, which is odd because I think I was watching her last time I did that as well. <laughs> Hi guys, Dane here and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Frightful First World War by Terry Deary, illustrated by Martin Brown. And this is a horrible histories book. You may be familiar with these if you were a child of the 90s in the UK and I guess they probably went global as well, I'm not too sure. Basically we've got here, horrible histories. It's history with the nasty bits left in. So on the blurb I guess it says, do you want to know why a pair of old socks gave away top German secrets? Why sniffing your own pee could save your life in a gas attack? What the fat king did with food scraps and dead horses? Discover all the foul facts about the frightful First World War. All the gore and more. If you haven't read a horrible histories book before, basically you get a nice little mixture of kind of cartoons to bring it to life as well as obviously the written book as well. As you can see, it's not a hugely dense book. It is designed more for children than for adults. However, that said, as an adult, I actually really enjoyed reading it. I mean, you get to see like little dramatizations of what's going on. A bit about Kaiser Wilhelm there. This little timeline of what happened in the first year of the first war. We have some little bit clippings from newspapers and that kind of stuff. Oh, we get Churchill. Churchill got sacked. He was a British minister at the time. And he got sacked because he came up with the uh, Gallipoli offensive. And, and it was not a... I shouldn't really laugh at that because lots of people died. But it was a bad idea, so he got sacked. But obviously he came back a little bit later. Said, uh, at Gallipoli, flies in the summer of 19 were very bad because of the number of unburied bodies. One soldier of the Australia and New Zealand Army Corps, the Anzacs, wrote home about the flies. Some of them must have tin openers on their feet, they bite so hard. Uh, a Brit soldier complained, in order to eat your food, you had to move your hand over it, then bite suddenly, otherwise a fly came with it. Any bit of food uncovered was blotted out of sight by flies in a couple of seconds. I mean, it was really horrible conditions that the soldiers on both sides had to live through. What the Germans used to do when they were de-licing themselves, they'd put a little pan over a flame, heat up the pan, and they'd chuck the lice into it and watch them sizzle and burn. We have here a bit of, bit of information about God. So, each side believed that they were in the right. That meant that God would be on their side. The Germans even went to war with a belt buckle that read, God mit uns, which means God with us. British soldiers saw the word uns and thought that proved what they knew. They were fighting the Huns. 
One very popular belief was that either God had your name and number on a bullet, or he didn't. So you may as well charge that machine gun. After the war, one soldier said, I was most amazed by the bullets that hit me. We have the third man thing. There's, there's this superstition that it's unlucky to light three cigarettes with the same match. The idea is, is that the first cigarette will catch his eye. The second cigarette will allow him to aim. And then on the third cigarette, he pulls the trigger. There was also this, uh, this thing that was designed to help soldiers not worry. So it says, don't worry. When you're a soldier, you can be in one of two places. A dangerous place or a safe place. If you're in a safe place, don't worry. If you're in a dangerous place, you can be one of two things. One is wounded and the other is not. If you're not wounded, don't worry. If you are wounded, it can be dangerous or slight. If it's slight, don't worry. If it's dangerous, then one of two things will happen. You'll die or you'll recover. If you recover, don't worry. If you die, you can't worry. In these circumstances, a soldier never worries. There was this great story about, uh, where was this? It was in a town. In a town called Albert in, Fra in Flanders, there was this statue that, that got hit by shell fire. And as you can see here, basically there was this superstition that when the tower got knocked down, the war would end. So the Germans kept on trying to knock this thing down and it just didn't work. It didn't work. And then in 1918, the Germans actually captured the town and they started using this tower. And so, so the British were outside and they started shelling the town. And they knocked the statue down <laughs> and then shortly afterwards the war ended and the Brits won. So there we go. It says here, with so many people dying in the First World War, it's not surprising that ghosts were reported. In 1916, there was a great rise in spiritualists, people who said they had the power to speak to the dead. And it says, uh, in late 1916, after terrible losses at the Battle of the Somme, where 20,000 Brits died on the first day alone, spiritualism became very popular in the UK with mothers trying to contact lost sons. Many fake spiritualists were caught and put in prison, but still the craze continued. I mean, <laughs> it's a bit of a redundancy, isn't it? I mean, there were a lot of German spies as well, and they got put to death as well. One of them got put to death for reporting what time the searchlights came on in, in London, which is you know, easy to obtain information as well. There's a the thing here, the Brits, the Brit soldiers were given these biscuits as part of their rations, and it says, the French peasants who gave room to British soldiers were glad of these biscuits. They made excellent fire lighters. Mmm, <laughs> that makes me hungry. It says, uh, Germany, in Germany they got so hungry, they even killed the kangaroos in the zoos and ate those. In April 1916, all Berlin butchers were closed for five days because they had no supplies of anything. My, one of my favourite parts of the whole book here. In July 1916, women demonstrated outside the town hall in Dusseldorf demanding more meat and potatoes. When the mayor offered them more beans and peas, they rioted and smashed every window in the town hall. <laughs> Says the winter of 1916 to 1917 is bitterly cold, but especially for the French. The Germans hold the northwest where most French coal mines are. One jeweler in Paris places a small lump of coal surrounded by diamonds in his window. <laughs> We have a quote here from All Quiet on the Western Front, which is an amazing book by Eric Maria Remarque. I recommend reading it, if, especially if you're interested in, in the wars. So the quote is, um, The experienced soldiers don't use the unpleasant indoor common toilet where 20 men sit side by side in a line. As it is not raining, they use the individual square wooden boxes with carrying handles on the sides. They pull three into a circle and sit there in the sun all afternoon, reading, smoking, talking, playing cards. In the British trenches, there weren't toilets, they just had buckets. We have some examples of the war slang, so I'll read this one to you. I'd love a bomb baby's head, followed by a dog and maggot washed down with gunfire. For afters, I'd have posse on Japan. So that means, I'd love some nice meat pudding, followed by bread and cheese, washed down with a cup of strong tea. For afters, I'd like jam on bread. We also have a great war code here, so... Uh, well, I'm going to read this to you, but also to, to help you kind of so this is a lot like the nato phonetic alphabet and i guess it's a forerunner to it and i happen to know the nato phonetic alphabet we have some uh, songs that were rewritten for the soldiers and he said but the song that summed up the first world war the best was the simplest one of all it was sung to the tune of old lang syne the one drunken parents join hands to sing at new year and embarrass you with it goes we're here because we're here because we're here because we're here Thank you, Booktube. Some of the illustrations are great. I, I like this This one here is a full page one and it, it doesn't happen that often. I would, have, I would have liked more full page illustrations, but it does work well when you've got pages like these where they're just kind of, you know, scattered throughout them really. It says here, uh, when, the, when the war started, German shepherd dogs in Britain suddenly became unpopular just because of their name. So the name was changed to Alsatian and it stayed that way ever since. Although admittedly, I think people use both of those names now. 
The miserable men didn't want women in the factories. They thought it would give the women a taste of freedom and change them. They were right. By the end of the war, British women could smoke cigarettes openly, drink in public houses, openly use cosmetics, swear, wear short skirts and bras, wear short hair to control the knits, go to the cinemas without a man, play football because most factories started girl teams, and then land girls who'd taken the jobs of farm labourers even began to wear their trousers off duty. Can you imagine that? Goodness me. We obviously have the fact that Hitler almost died in the First World War, but did not quite imagine how different history could have been. And I'm going to end with this other strange fact as well. A lot of the people who we know from the Second World War were taking part in the First World War in some sort of, you know, some sort of context. So even we had Churchill earlier, and we've just mentioned Hitler. And here we have uh, US soldier Major Harry S. Truman kept his battalion guns firing till the last seconds of the First World War. Nearly 30 years later, the Major was US President Harry S. Truman. He ordered the dropping of atomic bombs on Japanese towns. This brought the Second World War to an end. In a strange way, you could say the same man fired the last shot in the two world wars. So all in all, I really enjoyed this. I thought it was fascinating. I mean, I did actually learn some new stuff. I also got to go over some stuff that I already knew. I just find the First and the Second World War both to be very fascinating. I mean, I'm a pacifist, but I think it's important to learn from the past and, you know, to try to make sure something like that never happens again. So... Yeah, I thought even as an adult this really held up. I can see why as a kid you would love it. I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5 stars. And if you want to learn more about the war via a horrible histories book, I definitely recommend it. So there we have it. On that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book. And if not, whether you're going to be picking it up. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Hi guys, Dane here, and Biggie, of course. Weep, beep, 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 beep. He says hello. He's probably going to go back to sleep for the rest of this review now. But, uh, yeah. He is here, anyway. Just so that you don't think I'm using a weird camera angle for no, no reason. I just thought you might as well watch the cat sleep while I talk about books. So... Hi guys, it's Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Woeful Second World War, which is a horrible histories book by Terry Deary, illustrated by Martin Brown. If you're from the UK, I guess, I don't know how global these were, but these were huge when I was a kid. And uh, I picked up the ones on the First and Second World War from our local pound shop, read through them, actually really enjoyed them, so I thought I'd talk to you about them. So I'm going to read you the blurb here. Horrible histories. It's history with the nasty bits left in. Do you want to know who made a meal out of maggots? Which smelly soldiers were sniffed out by their enemies? Why white knickers could kill you? Discover all the foul facts about the woeful Second World War. All the gore and more. So this is basically, as it might sound, a non-fiction book about the Second World War. It's aimed at children really, but I maintain that you can also still enjoy it as an adult. I think what's quite cool about it as well is that it's got these illustrations throughout of it, like cartoons and other things like that that are just designed to help both entertain you as a reader and to help you to kind of learn information, I suppose. So, I mean, these are ideal if you've got kids or you're a big kid yourself and you want to learn more about the Second World War. Now, don't get me wrong, it does go fully into things like the Holocaust and even like to the point of it talking about people having to dig their own graves and getting shot and thrown in and all this sort of stuff, which is pretty bleak for children. But I kind of maintain that, well, it's history, isn't it? This happened. So we almost have a, you know, a duty to talk about it, I think. So I'm going to share a few of the different bits that particularly intrigue me about this one. So, for example, this story here about how, uh, how spies were sometimes caught. A woman SOE agent was parachuted into France from England. She arrived safely in a large town, but when she came to cross the road, she looked carefully to her right and was almost knocked down by a truck that was coming from her left. She simply forgot that the foolish French have the crazy habit of driving on the wrong side of the road. I know the wacky Americans do that as well. I don't understand it. But we, we do have the Australians. Shout out to any Australian viewers, to the 3.8% of my viewership that comes from Australia. Shout out to you guys. You also drive on the right side of the road, which is the left. The left side is right. Ah. The good news is that the truck missed her. The bad news is that a Gestapo officer saw what she did, guessed her secret, and arrested her. Bummer. Oh, I noticed this because, again, obviously I've been doing a lot of stuff about Latvia recently and Latvian literature. It's talking about the Soviets, so it says, The Soviets also imprisoned enemies inside Poland. Anyone who had connections around the world was an enemy. So all of the area's stamp collectors were rounded up and stamped out. 
When they later invaded Latvia, their records show they shot a woman because she was caught singing a Latvian folk song. While some, while some Germans shot any Russian peasants who could read and write. Anyone who is clever enough to read and write, they said, is clever enough to cause trouble. Which I would, I would argue they, there is quite a lot of logic to that as well. The Soviet prison officers in Latvia were utterly brutal. Every prisoner who came to them was tortured. But they weren't the carefully planned tortures that the Nazis used. The Soviet jailers beat prisoners with railings broken from fences, crushed their fingers in the doors of their cells, put thin books over their heads and beat them with hammers because they wanted to cause pain, not death from a fractured skull. One poor prisoner had his private parts wrapped in paper and was then set alight. Whole families of Poles, Latvians, Lithuanians and Estonians were sent to Soviet prison camps in Siberia. The conditions in the trains taking them were so bad that when they stopped at stations, the dead would be thrown out onto the platform. When they arrived in Siberia, things were worse. In temperatures of minus 40 degrees, they had to live in holes in the ground or huts made of straw and branches. The men, women and children who survived the cold were worked to death. Talks about some of the winners and losers of the war, so... So, sort of cigarette makers are obviously the, the winners because cigarettes were extremely popular but uh, one of the big winners here it says uh, Coca-Cola Coke had a good war it was supplied at a nickel a bottle to US soldiers Coca-Cola controlled 95% of the overseas soft drinks market during the war US soldiers drank 10 billion bottles in 1939 Coca-Cola had only five overseas bottling plants by 1945 they had 64 what made it so popular because the water was so disgusting. The army kept it clean by adding chlorine, so it tasted like your local swimming pool. Sometimes water was carried in old petrol tanks or oil drums just to add to the flavour. Their powdered coffee was dreadful, fruit juice was known as battery acid, and lemonade crystals made a drink that tasted of disinfectant. Alcohol was banned from the US forces. One tank crew got their hands on an enemy supply of champagne and almost ran over a jeep. A jeep carrying their general. Bummer. Oh, it talked here as well. I told Becker about this story. There was this family in German where their granddad died. And uh, let's see what... The, let me read the official thing here. So it says here, One Berlin family were definitely war losers. They lost their grandfather. Here's how it happened. So their grandfather died and they were like, We must take him to the mortuary. Well, we've got no coffin for the old chap. We could roll him in the carpet. So they roll him in the carpet, start taking him to the mortuary. Then the air raid siren goes off. So they just leave grandpa outside and run to the air raid shelter. And when they come back, the carpet's gone. And obviously grandpa was still inside it. We've got a bit about Leningrad. Leningrad was pretty dark. So uh, in January 1942, a Leningrad doctor visited a family. He described what he saw. A horrible sight met my eyes. It was a dark room covered with frost and puddles of water on the floor. Laid out on some chairs was the corpse of a 14 year old boy. In a pram was the body of a tiny baby. On the bed lay the owner of the room, dead. At her side stood her eldest daughter, rubbing her with a towel to try and revive her. In one day she had lost her baby, her brother and her mother, all perished with the hunger and the cold. It's horribly true, but not surprising, that some of the starving people of Leningrad removed the arms and legs of the corpses and ate them. Cannibalism was the only way that some survived. Yet the savage winter hurt the German attackers too. In time they were driven back and defeated. The starving of Leningrad may have been winners after all. It talks here as well about a Dutch boy called Robert de Hoey. So he was living in Java with his family when the Japanese invaded in 1942. And it basically compares him to Anne Frank because he also kept a diary. And we have some excerpts of the, of the translations. So basically his father was sent to one prison camp while he and his mother were taken to another. And they t they, uh, he survived actually, survived for three years of it. There was the case of a flight sergeant called Graham Hall who was so bad at writing he just never used punctuation. He once joked to his wife, Vera, if I am ever taken prisoner and I send letter with punctuation, then you should underline the next word. It will be a coded message. In June 1940, his bomber was shot down and the crew were taken to one of the famous Stalag Luft prisoner of war camps for airmen in northeastern Germany. Sergeant Hall wondered if his wife remembered their joke and he tried it. It worked so well that the British Secret Service used him to send and receive messages from the camp. News about German weapons and troop movements, requests for help with escapes and for equipment. Which I thought was lovely. We have this report from a, a magazine from London in, the, it was on the 22nd of March 1941, Nazi atrocity in Poland. Following the death of a German soldier, 100 Polish men were rounded up, most of them Jews, and marched through the streets with their hands tied behind their heads. They were ordered to dig their own graves and, to satisfy the barbaric cruelty of the soldiers, forced to perform a dance of death at the point of a bayonet for the Germans' amusement. 
There were various methods of execution, some shot, some hanged, and others tied to posts and stoned to death. We have a bit here about the exploding dogs that the Soviets used, and this is a true story, it's very sad. Basically they trained these dogs to like carry explosives and they were supposed to run beneath tanks and then the explosive would detonate. Obviously it would kill the dogs, it was suicide bomber dogs effectively. But the Soviets trained them on their own tanks, so then when they tried to use them in battle against the Germans, the dogs just ran under the Soviet tanks and blew up their own tanks. We have a thing here that kind of, this paragraph really shows the changing times as well, so... In the First World War, the British Army had won with the help of horses. They pulled the guns, carried supplies and made a tasty meal when food was hard to find. But by the Second World War, horses had no chance. In September 1939, Polish cavalry charged the German panzer tanks. A German soldier said, in a few minutes, the cavalry lay in a smoking, screaming mass of dismembered and disemboweled men and horses. Oh, we have a story about an American dog called Chips who landed in Sicily. And uh, he, it says here, Chips really earned his dog food by attacking a concrete machine gun installation. In spite of being wounded, Chips dragged an Italian machine gunner out by the arm and three others surrendered. Soldiers have sometimes captured these strongholds single-handedly, but Chips did it with no hands. Later the same day, he rounded up another 10 Italians. Oh, we have this as well, the Nazi girls. We have here the Nazi idea of a perfect woman. So, Minister Joseph Goebbels had said, A woman has the task of being beautiful and bringing children into the world. The hen bird makes herself lovely for her mate and hatches her eggs for him. Will you grow up to be a beautiful bird? Remember, good Nazi girls wear their hen in a bun or plaits, have blonde hair, wear no makeup, wear no lipstick, do not smoke, have broad hips, and never wear trousers. Oh, and you're also reminded that any girl under 18 caught smoking will be sentenced to two months in prison. So they did get some things right. That was a joke, by the way. Oh, and we have some stuff about the Hitler Youth as well, which is basically like young kids who, as the war went on and they ran out of soldiers, they got increasingly like adult jobs. So by 1945, the, the Hitler Youth were being ordered to help defend Germany. At one point, kind of halfway through the war, they got used to empty out corpses and stuff. Oh, oh, and then it says here, And when the war ended, the horrors weren't over for the Hitler Youth members. They were treated by the Allies as Nazis and made to help repair the damage of war. On the 30th of April 1945, a group of Hitler Youth aged from 10 to 14 were taken prisoner in Munich. US soldiers took them to Dachau concentration camp the next day. The boys were forced to help clear away the dead. One of these boys later wrote, We were taken to a railway siding. We were ordered to open the freight cars. With metal bars, we pushed back the doors. The skeleton of a woman fell out. After that, nothing more, for the dead bodies were standing so close to one another, like sardines. And then I think just the ending of this was very touching as well, so I'm going to read the last couple of paragraphs. They are the things that make the Second World War the most horrible history of all. The innocence of the victims, the vast numbers of them, and the unbelievable cruelty of some of the fighters. That's why ho truly horrible history can be so important. It helps us to look back at the horror and say the single word from the memorial at the destroyed village of Oradour sur Glan. Remember. And then it just says, why is it that the ones who most need to remember are the ones most likely to forget? So all in all, I thought this was fantastic. I mean, I always enjoy learning about the war. I mean, I know it's a horrible subject, but I do find it fascinating. And I never actually read this when I was a kid, which is a shame because I would have probably got even more from it. But still, even as an adult, I picked up quite a lot of stuff here that I didn't necessarily know before. It was just very enjoyable, and so for that I'm going to give it a 4.5 out of 5. It was very good, and I recommend it. So anyway, on that note, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this, and if so, what you thought of it. If not, let me know if you're going to be grabbing it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Say bye-bye, Biggie. Boo, 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 boo. Hi guys, Dane and Biggie here, and today we're going to be doing a quick review of Yours Etc. Letters to the Press by Graham Greene, aren't we, Biggie? Yes, we are. He seems excited. Now, I can't really blame him for not being too excited, because this is literally Graham Greene's Letters to the Press from 1945 to 1989. It says here, selected and introduced by Christopher Hawtrey, whoever that is. I will read, oh, I was going to read you the blurb, I don't think there is a blurb. I will read you a testimonial by Salmon Rushdie instead. An entertaining celebration of Graham Greene's lesser known career as a prolific author of letters to newspapers. You will find unarguable proof of his total addiction to everything about his time, from the greatest issues of the day to the humblest subjects imaginable. And that, I think, is a pretty good way of describing it, because 
it's very much a pro product of its time. So you're reading these letters, and they're not really presented with much, like, uh, what's the word? With much background. Um, what's the word, Biggie? What am I thinking? Context. Thank you, Biggie. You got it right. So, yeah, they're not. They don't come with much context. So you've got his letters, but like you don't really know what to make sense of them. Sometimes I didn't even know what he was talking about. Let me read you this random one to give you a feel for what this book is like. So this is Freedom and Justice in Ghana. He wrote this to the New Statesman, 20th of September, 1957. What an Alice through the looking glass world we enter when we read the political sections of the New Statesman. In your anonymous letter, under the above title, you write nothing could atone for the British record in West Africa, where people still recall the unparalleled horrors of the slave trade. From this one would imagine that the British had entered West Africa in order to enslave the population, when, of course, the exact opposite is true. Our colonies in West Africa were established to stop the slave trade, carried on between successful warring chiefs and the Arabs from the East. And whatever we may feel of the British record in East Africa, the worst that can be said of our record in the West was that the human element may sometimes have failed. There was never any planter problem. No white man has ever been allowed to own land in West Africa. And even though Lord Lugard's policy of indirect rule through the natives' chief may have retarded independence, not necessarily unwisely, it was a noble experiment. And that's it. That's presented like that with no context. I actually must say, a lot of the stuff he was talking about in terms of Britain's role in the rest of the world, like he was writing against, kind of, basically against the EU. He was, it was right near the end of his life. And I must admit, I didn't really entirely understand what he was talking about. Yeah, I don't know. It's just some of the things that he was saying in this I wouldn't necessarily agree with. I mean, to be fair, he was, like, born 100-odd years before I was, so perhaps that's why. Also, I mean, there was some interesting stuff on ter in terms of censorship and that kind of thing, but it didn't really go into as much detail as I was hoping for. And then it did go into lots of detail for stuff that I really wasn't too interested in. I can't really see why you would ever read this unless you were not just a Graham Greene fan because I'm a Graham Greene fan and I think I, he's my most read author or one of my no Terry Pratchett's my most read author Green is like number two or three without 40 of his books and I didn't enjoy this and so I, th I don't think it's even for Graham Greene fans I think you would have to be a scholar or you would need to be writing an essay about a specific time in history so for example if you're writing about the Cold War and you need sources you can find plenty of sources here of Graham Greene talking about obscure parts of the Cold War. That's fine. So I picked this up. This was my bedtime read. This replaced The Odyssey, which I finished last month. Because basically there are certain books that you can't really just sit and read from cover to cover. This one I was doing about 20 pages a night of, so it only took me two or three weeks. But it wasn't great. I think if I'd read it five to ten years earlier when I was in the height of my, like, Graham Greene fandom. Because now, while he is still one of my favourite authors... I have many other favourite authors as well who I've read 30, 40 plus books by, so he's kind of not the only one, if that makes sense. I don't know, the appeal just isn't really there for me. Uh, I will give it a 3 out of 5, it was it was alright, but um, it's a pretty specialist book. And I don't really know what I'm hoping to achieve by talking about it on Booktube. The only person who may slightly be interested is Mara from Books Like Woe, because she's a Graham Greene fan, and I know she read Agatha Christie's autobiography with me, so in comparison, this is actually kind of easy going, but, I mean, at least Agatha Christie's autobiography was kind of both entertaining and enlightening, whereas this was just confusing. So yeah, Graham Greene, yours, etc. Letters to the press. So on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.